Hello, I'm Brooks Rayford, President and CEO of the North Carolina Technology Association, or NC Tech, and welcome to this edition of NC Tech Chats, where I have brief discussions with interesting people doing interesting things. NC Tech is a statewide association with over 600 member companies and organizations and institutions. Our uh, member companies collectively employ over 200,000 North Carolinians, so quite a wide reach. I'm happy today to have as my special guest, Matthew Cook. He is a partner with Davis Moore, a Raleigh-based commercial real estate firm. He's got his finger on the pulse of what's going on these days in the office space environment, which is a pretty big topic in the news. Matthew, thanks for being with us to help us understand a little bit more about what's happening and what the trends might be. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Brooks. Sure. Uh, first, uh, tell us a bit about Davis Moore. What does the firm do? What is your clientele profile? Things like that. And then we'll dive into our topic for the day. Yeah, yeah, sure. So Davis Moore, we are a boutique uh, corporate real estate advisory firm headquartered in Raleigh. We have a, our office in Charlotte as well. Uh, we were founded about 10 years ago, 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, but the roots go back to the late 90s, where some of my partners had a small firm, sold it to one of the larger uh, global firms. And then we, a group of us kind of spun out, reformatted under the name Davis Moore in 2012, 2013. Um, fun fact, there's no one named Davis or Moore, but we can get into that uh, offline. Um, and so the company now, we have about 15 people in Raleigh uh, and five in Charlotte and really focus on working exclusively with the corporate occupier. And what we try to do is bring a boutique feel to large and complex transactions. And so, and really in just a couple of uh, industries, healthcare being one, life sciences, uh, we do some industrial and manufacturing, and then high tech is another core uh, business that we're involved in. Um, and we like to say, again, a, a boutique feel, but working with large, complex transactions. And while we're small, uh, we've worked with some of the largest employers and uh, many of the largest transactions in our state over the last several years. Only for the corporate occupier, though, never on the uh, the the on behalf of a of, of an insurance company or REIT or something like that that owns property. Gotcha. Yeah, the firm's name. I'm sure you get called Davis a lot or Mr. Moore. <laughs> uh, so there's been a lot of press lately about the impact of uh, COVID on the office space, not just commercial real estate broadly, but particularly the office space um, situation. Uh, in fact, the U.S. Census Bureau just released a report uh, showing that the portion of people working from home tripled between 2019 and the end of 2021 with the triangle ranking in the top five metros in the country with a 31% level of uh, people working remotely. How is this impacting the commercial or office real estate environment here? Oh, yeah. so, I mean, you know, it's every podcast or, or news article I feel like you read or listen to uh, recently, everybody is talking about the, the office apocalypse or the slowdown in CRE, specifically with big box retail and office space. And we're certainly f seeing that in the triangle area as well. I think that the Overall vacancy somewhere between 14 and 15 percent, um, and you know the there's about almost five million square feet of sublease space on the market in the triangle um, right now as well, and so certainly is is tr tremendously softer than what it was called March 1st of 2020. Um, you know, I feel like in in a lot of respects when you think about the big subleases that are available in our marketplace, a lot of these were. Uh, big corporate campuses for mm -hmm. companies that aren't headquartered here that potentially could have happened anyway. And I'm not going to use names in, the, in this podcast, but I think you may, may know who some of these are, where your companies were either acquired by private equity or had moved headquarters to a different area based on a transaction, some M&A. Um, and I think that the trend of remote work certainly accelerated a lot of that and where they that um, teams were able to kind of do their task in a remote environment. And as the Fed policy has had everybody focused on reducing cost and maintaining and preserving uh, cash, um, it became an opportunity to really look at, okay, real estate, second biggest cost of labor. How do we preserve cash flow? Um, and so all of those factors are in play right now. Some of it is, again, trend driven with just remote work or hybrid work taking hold. And a bit of it also is just the economic cycle. So we're kind of feeling both of those, which is, uh, you know, where resulting where we are. Um, 
you know, and so we will we will see. We are slowly seeing people in, in some respects, though, the companies that are headquartered here trying to bring their teams back together. I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well, I'm sure. Um, so it's a it's a soft market. Um, as you raise your other point, uh, Raleigh being one of the largest um, percentages of people working from home it's amazing how many people I have met that have moved here. Uh, since the pandemic began and are still working for their companies in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, by way of example, where they've just moved in and immigrated into the area, but are still working in other places. At the same time, you had a lot of firms kind of unleash their recruiters on LinkedIn and say, hey, you can stay in Raleigh, but we'll pay you a Bay Area wage and you can just stay working on your couch. So I think a lot of that has kind of led to where we are now with this large percentage of people uh, working from home. Yeah, there are a lot of factors at play there for sure. Um, you know, I, you know this because you've actually participated in uh, in this polling that we do, but NC Tech has done quarterly polling during and since the pandemic, asking leaders in the tech sector a mix of questions, including about hybrid or remote work, um, and as well as uh, plans for office space or office footprint. And our respondents have consistently indicated that they're likely to either keep or grow their footprint, in part due to anticipated headcount growth, but also to have less density uh, and more flexibility for their employees and teams. So maybe keeping the space they have with fewer people in it at a given time, but again, a little more flexible in the use of that space uh, and having a little more spread out <laughs> um, environment uh, internally. So I'm curious uh, what you're seeing along these lines and maybe tie this into some of the work I'm sure you're doing and are being asked to do as a firm on helping uh, tenants reimagine their workspace. Well, I imagine that those results may be a little bit different just given the where we are in the economic cycle since you did the last poll. I mean, we're recording this, what, May 4th, and you've got a couple of more, couple, uh, two more banks that are in trouble and the, and the Fed just raised rates to Five two five, I think, and so I think everybody's in a pretty much wait and see and holding pattern uh, for the most part right now. All that said, we're, we've reached a point in the hybrid or remote work where most leaders I speak to are really frustrated, and they want to bring the teams back. There's just a lack of culture. Uh, there's a lack of collaboration, uh, and and there's also a lack of trust both ways. I think that employees. You know, a lot of the young folks or everybody, an employee wants to know how they're doing. Am I valued? Am I being measured? Am I part of a team? And when you take all of those things away, it creates a lack of trust with the employer. And the same thing, the employer is thinking at, at times, are my people working? Are they bought in? Are they part of the team? And so there's a big push right now. We've got one client uh, in the tech industry that's brought everybody back five days a week. And kind of said, hey, you can self-select in, you can self-select out, but this is how we are, are going to operate and how we're going to uh, win as a business. Uh, we have another client that just announced they're back two days a week and are uh, very much pushing to go for a third. And then we, you know, I was talking to a data security company yesterday that they have uh, they've announced most of their new hires are going to be triangle based and try to bring people back into the office. And so there is this push to bring teams back together. Um, and what we're seeing with real estate decisions is that, you know, to entice people and incentivize people to want to come back, um, there's a number of things that come into play. Flexible hours, of course, uh, is, is at the top of the list, but also this flight to quality where people really want to move into buildings that offer a lot more than just your run of the mill suburban office back office campus. And so, you know, things like access to restaurants and food and bev uh, so the teams can eat and drink together, um, shared conference facilities, fitness, uh, child care, all of these things are what tenants really want now so that they can bring their teams back together. And I'm kind of, I'm going to go off in a, in a direction that's not entirely office space related, but I thought it was um, interesting. The Surgeon General announced on Tuesday that chronic loneliness is just as bad for for health as smoking 12 cigarettes a day. And that. it's it's interesting that we're starting to talk about this now that we've all been apart for three years. And so, of course, I've got a self-serving interest in this. I mean, I, I work in office space and I'm not going to deny that, but you know, I feel like we as, as a community, we owe it to ourselves. Maybe, you know, maybe it's not five days a week. I'm not advocating that, but 
people, we are social animals. We've got millions of, of years of evolution where we've been tribal and together. And I think as humans, we need that. We need to be with our teams a couple of days a week to cure some of these issues that are ancillary. I think return to work is part of that. Got you. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to zero in on it. <clears throat> Just thinking about when COVID really first hit, this is the uh, March timeframe of 2020. It's now spring of 23. So lots of leases will be coming up for renewal soon since we're now at that three-year mark or so yeah. from when everything kind of shut down. What are you hearing from both landlords and leaseholders? This is sort of a crystal ball question as to what may happen when this avalanche or cascading avalanche of renewal decisions uh, starts to really hit. Yeah, you know, it's, um, there's a couple of risks there because not only are, are leases going to start to come due, but also, you know, loans are going to come due as well. And so you've got this rising rate environment where um, at the same time, leases could be coming up. And mm -hmm. The trend has been that companies are either going to try to just extend for a very short amount of term just to buy flexibility and try to figure it out later, or potentially, again, use go for that, for that flight to quality where we'll invest in a bit smaller footprint, but in a nicer building hmm. so that we can offer all these amenities that, to incentivize people to come back together. And so I think where you're going to see... Um, some more softness play out, I guess, is to put it the best way, is again, the suburban back office office buildings that don't have any amenities mm -hmm. and could experience an increase, in, an even further increase in vacancy as things come up because there's going to be this flight to quality or inner and a resetting of footprints. Makes sense. Well, we got a few minutes left, and I want to end, uh, as I often do with these discussions, uh, asking you to tell me about you. What's your background, and how did you get into this line of business and sort of your journey to this moment? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I grew up in Wilmington. I uh, went to UNC Chapel Hill and graduated in 02, and I moved to D.C. wanting to be like you, Brooks. I wanted to be a lobbyist. And I thought that I was going to go uh, work uh, in the do the D.C. thing for a couple of years and then go back and go to law school quickly realized that I didn't want to be a lawyer and like all great decisions uh, as it relates to career, I moved back to North Carolina and to Raleigh for a girl who is uh, now my wife. And so when I realized that I was, when I moved back here, I quickly realized I needed to find a job. Um, I was doing business to business sales and consulting in Washington. Um, and as for studying the market, I thought, okay, Raleigh is a high growth place. There's going to be a lot of commercial real estate activity uh, going on in the area. This was 2005, 2006 timeframe, something like that. And I thought, well, I've got the skill set from doing business to business kind of consulting and sales that transfers into doing tenant representation work. And I was lucky enough to get my first job for with the Staubach company, a guy named Guy Harvey um, gave me my first opportunity and uh, had a great career and some great mentors along the way. Uh, Bill Sandridge at JLL was just a great mentor as well. And then my current business partners in Austin Coon and John Stubbs um, over at Davis Moore as well. So I've been very lucky. It's been a lot of great people uh, that have helped me along the way and had the privilege to work with some amazing clients as well. Well, that's the first time I had uh, heard about the Guy Harvey connection. I actually uh, knew him and he worked on the same hallway uh, as me a while back. So uh, small world. <laughs> yeah. Well, Matthew, thank you very much for taking the time to, to join me today, and thanks for um, helping us understand a subject that's been pretty prominent in the news of late and probably will continue to be as things uh, play out, as you describe. And for our viewers, you can find previous editions of NC Tech Chats and other programming on our YouTube channel, which can be found on our website at nctech.org. Thanks, everyone, for watching.